Well, I think the crucial thing right now that law enforcement is looking at is communications records. Uh, with whom were the suspects in contact? Whom were they emailing, texting, calling? Because that will tell them whether this is a broader conspiracy, how the plot might have been funded, uh, whether there's anyone still out there that they need to apprehend, whether there's, there's an overseas connection or whether it's purely domestic. So that's probably the main thing that they're uh, looking at right now. The other thing is I think they might be going to data mining companies with which law enforcement has contracts to find all sorts of other records, financial records, travel records, uh, credit card expenditures and things like that. Again, to get as much background as possible on the weeks and months leading up to this incident. So what can you get from the average smartphone these days? Oh, from the smartphone, again, you can, uh, well, from the smartphone and its providers, uh, you can get, so you can get the email traffic, the text messages, uh, the phone traffic, uploads to social media sites. Those are probably the most significant things. But for, in each case, you've got to go to the provider of that service to get the record, since obviously they're not going to be in possession of the smartphone, at least for the suspect who's still on the loose. So, I mean, obviously we don't know yet how law enforcement came to identify these guys. Uh, what do you think will ultimately be the most uh, valuable piece of information to come from this, uh, this kind of approach, the data mining approach? Uh, I think it'll be the uh, phone records and the email and text uh, records, and possibly social media, if that was a means by which they were communicating, because I think that will just tell us the most. And after that, travel records. You know, it's very important to know, did they travel abroad uh, in some period before the incidents? Because that would give you some suggestion, perhaps, that this is internationally sponsored. The, the story in social media about misinformation, we discussed it earlier in our show this hour. Um, you know, the, the, the pro of being able to have all this information at our fingertips, the con of perhaps information or inaccurate information being there too. Uh, in the data mining process um, for things away from social media, uh, how often does that happen? How much misinformation, if you will, will you stumble upon in an investigation? With, with data mining, it's not as much of a risk because you're dealing there with cold, hard facts. You know, what, what did somebody spend on a, on a hotel room or where did he travel, things like that. So you've already got uh, usually an identified suspect and you're trying to get more information about that person. Where you can go awry with data mining is if you don't have an identified suspect and you're trying to cast a, a wide net and find information that might identify a suspect. You know, that sort of needle in a haystack approach. And there you can end up looking at people and looking hard at, at people who turn out to be innocent. But it's, it's less of a risk there, uh, particularly when you have uh, an identified suspect. And, and what about the idea of authorities being very concerned about whether or not uh, this suspect in particular is able to monitor social media right now to figure out where the authorities are. I mean, I think we saw the Cambridge police, even through their Twitter, trying to advise people to be careful about what they were saying because potentially it's something that could affect the overall uh, ability to track him down. Um, what, do you, what do you think about all that? Well, I think that's a real concern. You know, we know that Jahar is a, an active Twitter user. If he's following uh, Twitter right now or another social media site or is even looking at news websites and they're posting uh, real-time information about what house or what street the police are on and wh where they're searching uh, and he's on that street or the next street or something like that, you know, that, that could be very disruptive information, disruptive to the investigation. And what role do the authorities themselves have to play in, in stopping that flow of information? Just to go back to that uh, tweet from the Cambridge police, uh, what they said was, we've suspended our automated crime incident tweets uh, as search for suspects continues in case monitoring police response via social media. So obviously there's, there's it's kind of a two-step process, I would imagine, to, to limiting the information. Well, you know, I think that's really as far as law enforcement would generally go, is making a request like that for uh, the media and for private citizens not to tweet specific information l like that that could harm the investigation and the apprehension of the suspect. They're typically not going to try to go beyond that to try to, you know, shut down Twitter 
uh, as a whole. You know, there'd be very serious legal problems with that approach, and it's, it's highly unlikely they'd even try.